Did you go to Laredo? There was a long drive. Uh, we went to, yeah, well, we're streaming, so. Uh, <laughs> Like, <laughs> keep it off the internet. <laughs> I bury her in a. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, there you go. Sorry, I'm just trying to like get my get my monitors going. But first, I cut her body up. <laughs> <laughs> The NSA is clearly not doing its job in fucking DC, so. <laughs> okay, okay, this seems to be working. We're going. Let me just check the audio. Getting the body up. Great stuff. Cool. Okay. I'm sure there are viewers. It says there's not viewers. Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to get going. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this discussion uh, of the Tulsa, our experiences at the Tulsa Artist Fellowship. And um, just going to quickly preface before we start sharing our experiences that um, we are not unbiased and we are in a lot of well i think in all our cases have a lot of anger and you know uh rage because there has been no accountability and um uh yeah we haven't had any apology or solutions um you know so um yeah we'll we'll, we'll tell more but um and and also please let us know if the audio, please talk in the chat. If there's audio issues, uh, I'll try and respond to them and fix those. And also, please leave questions. And um, yeah, we expect this will go a bit long because, yeah, we want to talk. And um, so to begin, uh, basically, we're going to each share kind of quickly and like roughly chron chronological order our experiences and um, then we're going to kind of have a discussion um, about what maybe can be done going forward, what we'd like to see happen, etc. Um, and joining us, Hyde Fontana, Naima Lowe. Um, okay, so I'll just start uh, because, so Basically, uh, I joined the fellowship two years ago or something, and things kind of immediately went. I I will say I was very cautious going in because I knew former fellows that had massive problems, and um, yeah, so I was skeptical, and things kind of immediately did go south for me. Like, I think the first big incident was I asked about. Uh, health insurance because we weren't getting fully we were, were our health and we didn't get health insurance covered through the fellowship but we got a small stipend that wouldn't cover the full cost of health insurance i brought that up as an issue with carolyn sickles the director and it didn't go well but then kind of the major red flag in that incident was uh a few weeks later i asked for feedback on a proposal that had been rejected and uh Carolyn told me that because I had raised this issue of not being able to pay for health insurance, that that indicated I wouldn't be able to pay for this project and that that was a basis to reject my proposal. And so I said that seemed really messed up to me and this violation of the divisions of responsibilities and I was accused of, you know, never have I been spoken to this way, you know, Carolyn told me and like, how dare you bring this up, etc. Um, and then the main incident that was mentioned in the Catherine Wagley's article was a f bit after that, um, I organized this event called Margaritaville 2049. And um, I gave kind of a mini presentation in the middle of it that was about how George Kaiser had made his money and become a billionaire. And uh, 
it was they the staff Abby Mashunkache, the communications manager, was like pacing on the phone with the director Carolyn during my performance and tried to shut the performance down. Um, and I, I was able to just finish it. Um, she was interrupting your performance. Like yeah. She was between you and the crowd. Yeah. Right. And um, so they shut that, or they tried to shut it down. And then afterwards, basically, it was like this long series of meetings and reprimanding. And the main thing was I had previously, they had approved a proposal. Hide a little quiet. Um, they had previously proposed a, approved a proposal to. Um, sorry, I'm distracted. Uh, to bring like five or six artists to Tulsa over the course of the next four months. Those had all been agreed upon. You know, dates had been set, and so they canceled that. And I wasn't able to bring any of those artists. I had to tell them they couldn't come to Tulsa. And yeah. Uh, it was just uh, basically, I don't know. I, I'm going to kind of try and wrap it up there. But it was, it left me in this place where it was really unclear whether this idea that they had the ability to censor us, like what was the role of, uh, who is the curator, who is has the final say on what we produce. And I just got the sense that the, there was no distinction and that uh, they kind of felt licensed to, I mean, Carolyn said she considers herself a collaborator with all of us in the fellowship and that as a result, like anything we do needs to have her approval. Okay, hide in the email, I'll bring that up in a second. Um, and so, yeah, and so that was partially what inspired me to start OK Number One was the need for this space that was like fully fired walled off from the fellowship where they would have no say over what happens and where I could do work without, uh, yeah, just without acknowledging them or without them having any influence. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's a very brief summary, um, but I'm going to give it over to Hyde and I'm going to try and raise your volume too. Um, well, what's interesting about this, Lucas, is that, um, you know, on the website and in all of their rhetoric, um, they like to say these are unrestricted funds and uh, you work on your, independently on your own projects. And then when you're there and interacting with the leadership of TAF, um, they sort of wedged their way into uh, your process. And um, I don't think I would have ever agreed to go to a place <laughs> with a practice of censorship or involve the director involving themselves in your projects. It's, they're not fucking collaborators. They are funders. Like it is insulting <laughs> to think that you would have to take on a collaborator to have a project funded. Like, like, that's nothing we're agreeing to. And, you know, I just wanted to say, as someone that was in the audience when your performance was interrupted and stopped, it happened in uh, the Archer building and it was during a first Friday and there were probably 60, 70 people in, a, in, in the space watching. And probably half fellows and half public. And it was really embarrassing as a fellow to watch staff disregard and disrespect your performance in this way. And we were all a little shocked. We're all like looking at each other, going, like, is this really happening? Like, what is like, <laughs> like, and in subsequent meetings, it was never brought up. And when we asked months later for like, can we please talk about what happened to Lucas and why you censored his performance? That began my trouble with, with my, well, I won't say it began my trouble, but it began, began my feud with leadership because I dared to, on the behalf of another artist to ask for 
accountability. And like, not, I wasn't coming at it like, how dare you do this? It's like, can you talk about this and tell us, are there rules that we don't know about? Can any of us get censored? What is off limits? <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's disturbing to upend your life, go to Tulsa with the expectation that you're going to be funded for three years was my understanding, uh, which was truncated without explanation. Uh, and you know, that, that's just a whole other thing, but, uh, where are we going with this? Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about my project briefly is that like, <clears throat> right as you were really getting in hot water, Lucas, I had pitched a project to create a community space in Tulsa because according to their mission statement, et cetera, they are really interested in engaging with the community of Tulsa. And so I created this concept for a place called the, the Lodge of St. Rabor Leroux. And it was supposed to be sort of like a fraternal organization slash church slash hangout. But, um, you know, we were going to host readings, shows, workshops. Like, I was really, in terms of the programming, and it was a hybrid, so I wanted it to be a space that was available to fellows, but also to the community. We were going to be open five days a week. We were going to be staffed by interns. I was going to be there most of the time. But, but the idea was like, there's no space like this in Tulsa where we can meet, where we can work or not work, but we can be and we can find community and we can discuss things and we can, we can share. And um, the, 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 uh, uh, the proposal was approved. The funding was approved. And as I was going forward, <laughs> that's Jake, um, as I was going forward with um, build, building it out and readying it for the public, I was simultaneously working on uh, uh, soliciting participation. And I had really terrific buy-in from the fellows. And then Carolyn told me that like, oh no, we, we it's funny my dog's fussing now too. Um, but but as I'm, I'm preparing, you know, uh, simultaneously working to get programming for it. Like the administration was like, we're really not comfortable with working with people outside of the fellowship. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of a big deal because this was a space that we were going to share. And then it got whittled away, whittled away, whittled away. Like it became so controlling. And I was like, you guys approved this project. You guys funded this project. And I poured my entire fellowship into doing this this year. And now I'm being restricted to, I can have people there. We're open five days a week, but we can only have an event on Tuesdays. <laughs> and, and it was, and there were all kinds of reasons for that. Like, oh, there's a shortage of staff. Uh, and I was like, well, we don't really need staff, but the director <laughs> wanted someone from staff to be there when anything happened because they were really afraid of artists. Well, they were afraid of artists. I can't even say what they were afraid of because I had no previous record of doing something completely subversive or dangerous, immoral, but that's how I was treated. <laughs> and I'm in my mid fifties. And I ran an artist residency for five years in Dallas. Like, I'm not an unknown. I'm not, like, unstable, <laughs> you know. But that's how I was treated. And they made, they really, they, they, they twisted the, the project so much. But I kept going. And I kept going with, with everything that I could. Because also at that time, other people were involved in wanting to do things and wa wanting to share the space, excited about the space. Um, but eventually, like, they took my keys away and I was forbidden from being there. 
Um, and it was my work. It was my artwork. And it was something I had generated and it was a living thing. It wasn't like they kept trying to, sorry if I'm going a little bit long. They kept trying to say that it's like, well, you built this space and that's that. It's like, no, that's not that. It's, it's an active thing that relies on participation, cooperation, the community. Like this is, this is alive right now and your, your foot is on its throat. Um, and sorry, I've kind of, well, they, yeah, they took my key. I was forbidden from being there. And this also was not about an incident. This was not about me having like a naked drug party there. It was about being handed like secondary and tertiary contracts that said, if you want to continue with this project, um, we own all rights and images to this work and you only have access to it, Hyde Fontenot, <laughs> at the sole discretion of the director of the Tulsa Artists Fellowship. And I was like, well, this is insane. This is intellectual property theft. This is the seizure of an artwork. Like who, like, can we talk? And I, I would say like, you know, there were lawyers involved, their lawyers, by the way, I never hired a lawyer, but they, they lawyered up. And I was like, can we please contact a contemporary art curator so that you can educate yourself around what an artwork is and how to protect it and not to damage it and not to shut it down and not to censor it. That was a really alarming is that it wasn't about content. It was about control. And like, what if something happened? I remember Carolyn actually telling me like, well, what if, you know, something is going on at the, at, at the lodge and I don't know about it. And someone from GKFF wanders in there and they're like, oh, well, I was over at the lodge and there was some stuff going on there and I could lose my job. She says this to me, I could lose my job. I was like, I'm not intending to, to, to cause you to lose your job then. Right now, I would love it if she lost her job <laughs> because she's yeah. terrible at her job. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll end there. That seems like a good place to end. Oh, Hud. Yeah, I remember that conversation. Remember, I came with you to, yeah, yeah. Um, to sort of be moral support. And I think that's yeah. partly where you and I became the like evil gaze of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we were like, this is queer space. We want to protect it. People are so excited about this you know, okay, maybe there's some comp compromise we can make. And you remember Carolyn says, oh, oh, I know about queer space. Yeah, you don't know. And plowed right over. <laughs> Everything, that, all the concerns. And um, so, yeah, I'm Naima Lowe. I came to the fellowship at the same time as Lucas. So in the beginning of 2019, moved with a lot of kind of excitement at the prospect of kind of working in this community, figuring out some projects. Um, and, you know, early on through my time there faced some of the same, I won't go into details, but some of the same kinds of things that Lucas and I had talked about, which this pattern um, that was really consistent, which was something would come up, um, control was often at the center of it. <laughs> and but the pattern that I really got like distressed by with it, like the initial thing would be bad enough and maybe even not that bad, like, you know, not to discredit the realities of being censored Lucas, but it's like, I could imagine being in the role of, of a director of a program and in the immediate kind of being freaked out, like, oh, our sole funder is being talked about, what do I do? Right, and we're all adults, shit happens, you make a mistake, or maybe it's not a mistake, maybe you're feeling totally justified. I don't know, that's not my job. But what would then happen is that because you or I or anyone else said, wait a second, that concerns me. Like, or can we talk about this? Or can we understand this? Can we all uh, like operate as if we are all like adults who witnessed a set of things happening? Um, and would just be told, do not speak about it. You don't know what you saw. How dare you speak to me that way? You're wrong, this is terrible. And actually escalate the initial thing into this whole other like 
shit show. And I witnessed and was part of various <laughs> kind of things like that. And partly because, you know, to this day, I'll sort of be like, like, I'm the dumbass that when somebody in leadership says, we want your feedback, I say, think, oh, you do. <laughs> ah, <laughs> lesson learned. Um, um, and so would say, you know, to the effect of like, for example, with Lucas, it's like, look, I think I even was in a meeting at one point said something to the effect of what I just said, which is like, I can understand that. But like, maybe we can all just acknowledge the challenges of having a sole funder and an arts program and talk about it because we're all adults and da, da, da. And it was like, shut up. You don't get to speak and we're going to call you into meetings and there's going to be lawyers and threats and new contracts. And, and I want to be really clear that we're not being hyperbolic when we say threats or new contracts or lawyers. There was like constant sort of litigious language attached to things, frequently sort of like your contract could be, you know, to just be able to stay here or to work on this project to do other things could be compromised. And in addition to, you know, these specific works that folks are talking about, it's like these people in this program, these people aren't just paying you a stipend, they're also your landlord, mm -hmm. right? And so if you, the, the, the stakes are pretty high at that point. It's not like, your, right, studio and your studio home. and your housing. And so, you know, it's not like, you know, I have a contract for 1500 bucks to do a thing and I get into it with the, the person who's doing it and then that sucks i'm out that 1500 but then i go about my business right this was this is like your entire livelihood so all that's to say is i ended up in the throes of so many of these similar kind of things partly because i was a dumbass who would try to challenge things partly because i found it kind of hor horrifying to see my peers being treated the way they were and was unwilling to sort of was unwilling to sort of accept this kind of badgering that I was the one who was wrong because I was bringing things up rather than that there were problems that need to be addressed. I just wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and yeah, you successfully navigated in other institutions. Oh yeah, absolutely. You, you know what you're talking about. I'm not a, you were exactly. Very I'm, you know, fair minded exactly. and a good communicator. You know, I'm 40 years old. I've been a working artist my whole life. My parents are working artists. Like I was on the board of a foundation that does arts granting for five years, yeah. right? Like I'm not, we're not, and, and that's a common thing too. There's a lot of really exceptional, talented, experienced people in this program. And our, so when we would bring these challenges, we weren't bringing them as of nowhere. It was from experience. Um, with literally the same work mm -hmm. and being told like, absolutely not, you have, you know. So I, I went back and forth on a lot of different issues, got called in to lawyers. You know, my personal favorite was the quote mediation that uh, yes. <laughs> Hyde and I got <laughs> kind of like basically bullied into that where we weren't allowed to have any of our own representation. We weren't allowed to sort of ask any questions. The, the mediator that was hired was worked for the same law firm that represents the foundation and is also, and TAF, and is also like tied up in, you know, they're basically the one and the same, this, this law firm. Um, this guy, Kaiden Prepom, who was the medi quote mediator, mm -hmm. and who also was like running for public office on a like anti-choice, like pro, pro family, like basically like, hey, hey to queer weirdos, brown people having a conflict about power. Why don't you talk to this like anti-gay, anti-choice white man who works for the same people who you are in conflict with? And I'm yeah. supposed to think, oh yeah, these people are, are interested yeah. in what I, in my needs or, you know, and I mean, it was just such a, and throughout that, it's also really important to say that while the direct conflicts were consistently with the director, with Carolyn Sickles, I and other people were persistently speaking to anybody, um, you know, the program used to have an advisory committee, we we're talking to people there, they, we had contacts within GKFF, we would try to, and you know, but it was just, we go nowhere. Anyway, 
I considered leaving by the end of, you know, 2019, um, thought to myself, maybe I can make it if I just try to keep my head, like not deal with too much. I mean, came into the new year, getting some shit, but I was just like, I'm just gonna try to work it out. I had some health issues. I was gonna, you know, as Hyde had said, been told I was gonna get to be there for three years and I had uprooted my entire fucking life in order to do it. And so I had like plans and trajectories and stuff to work with. So I was gonna try to make it through that second year. Um, and in late February of, uh, of that year, I had my, studio had been moved downstairs to a space that um, was on the ground floor and had windows that faced an alleyway. Four kids, four like 11, 12 year old black kids see me in this space, you know, start yelling, saying all this awful shit, banging on the windows. You know, they had a very obviously fake gun, you know, those ones that are like gray with the orange tip. And it was really obvious, like they were trying to start shit. They were trying to like get themselves into trouble. And I was an obvious target. Um, it was obnoxious. It was shitty. Um, I, they, I turned off the lights initially, went into the alleyway later to sort of see where they were because they clearly weren't going anywhere. And I was concerned that they would get murdered by the police because we live in America. And so, and these kids, you know, there was no adults around and I went and confronted them. Um, it was awful. They didn't stop. We had this whole confrontation. They like threw shit at me. But I basically went like full auntie on them and was like, get the fuck out of here before these white people call the cops on you. And they did. So I, and then, you know, so I'm shaken, come back in, you know, tell friends, tell people in the fellowship initially what had gone on, opted not to call the police at that point. Again, I live in America. Um, <laughs> like, and also like just real basic, I live in America. I also am like pretty deeply like knowledgeable and somewhat inside like sort of abolition politics relative to dealing with the police. And like the police don't fix in immediate emergencies. Even if you have to call them, you don't, they don't, there, there's nothing that was gonna be helpful for them to do in that moment. And the odds of them making things worse was really high. And so the crisis was passed, but I reported it to the fellowship, initially got some like from the, um, kind of like facilities director, kind of like, oh, we'll be nice to you. Like a sort of like, how are you kind of response, but then nothing for like three or four days. And my spidey sense told me, I was like, these motherfuckers are trying to figure out liability, <laughs> right? Like, because it happened on their property, um, you know, they didn't have a process because as we've talked about, they're understaffed, they're always going for bigger rather than better. And, you know, I don't think they were prepared for that kind of situation. And so I hear nothing for days until I get this like incident form that I'm supposed to fill out. And it was just like really humiliating and awful and weird. And no one was really communicating with me or like being like, are you okay? Someone threw a brick at you. I know that like the threat of police violence might be a little stressful, et cetera, nothing like that. I run into Carolyn in the hallway of our building and I was like, what is happening? Do you not know I was assaulted? Did it something to that effect? And she goes, oh, what do you mean? This is not the time or place. And I was like, okay. And then an hour <laughs> later, an hour later, I get this like litigious message being like, you have violated the contract and Da, 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 you have harassed the director of this program and made her feel bullied and all this other shit. And, you know, and then two days later, get a letter from Taft's lawyers saying the same, but more like in lawyery speak. And like, you have to come to this meeting, you know, that's a Friday, I gotta come to the meeting by Monday or else I could lose my fellowship. Da, 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 da you know, and when I get into that meeting on Monday, I mean, granted, I did try to like talk to lawyers and figure some shit out. But when I got into that meeting on Monday, they tell me in addition to that supposed contract violation of talking to Carolyn, this white woman who is in charge of my life, uh, that made her uncomfortable, you know, violation one. Violation two was that I hadn't been posting enough like glowing shit on social media 
for, to their liking. I <laughs> We'll um, talk about your assault later. Right. I was like, like cool. You know, I, I think I blocked them. So I was like, you're weird. I don't want to deal with you. And so that was violation two. And there's some <laughs> other stuff. It was really weird. But at one point, the, their lawyer said, Naima, we're very concerned, you know, about your judgment and your well-being. I mean, you went out into that, that alleyway and you made this happen to yourself. So like blame me for my own attack. And then I said, and when I said, you know, I'm dealing with children. So... I operated as if I was dealing with children. And this woman says, well, in my experience, those aren't children. <laughs> oh, let's get her on a jury. <laughs> yeah, and she said, based on her experience working in like youth criminal courts and stuff, children aren't children. This is Carolyn right? Janney, by the way. Uh, yeah, Carolyn Janney. Um, and I sat there and watched Carolyn Sickles and Abby Michonne Cachet listened to this woman tell me that children aren't children. And this whole thing kind of goes on, I'll skip many horrific legalistic steps. I, you know, me going back and forth being like, can I stay with these people? Can I go? They're trying to kick me out. They're trying to get me to sign something that says that I had violated the contract. Yeah. You know, and I was like refusing, but trying to figure out what to do. You wanted just to be left alone. Meanwhile, coronavirus is happening, right? And so I'm trying to figure that shit out. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, and obviously, you know, into the spring, I kind of started ignoring them because obviously coronavirus is, you know, everyone's top priority for a while. And I'm mostly just kind of being like, I need to just focus on my health and all that stuff. But meanwhile, they're still trying to, you know, blame me for my own attack, get rid of me, all this other stuff. And then by June, they're posting all this like, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> now more than ever, we are a no corporate nonprofit, not even a nonprofit, we're a corporate entity that really needs to be seen like we care about Black people now more than ever. <laughs> and so, and I think that was like a, a turning point for me where I was just like, I cannot deal with your bullshit anymore. It's insulting. And that's when it was insulting. It was obnoxious. It was infuriating. It was gaslighting. And that was the point when I had the lawyers that I was working with say, I'm done. I'm, I'm trying to get out of here. We had filed, you know, federal employment um, complaints that are still pending and, and basically said, you know, give me a severance out of my contract to just leave me alone. You know, yeah. like, they refused. Um, I haven't heard from them since August. My lawyer, they won't respond to my lawyers, whatever. And basically they just like hustled me out the door as quickly as possible. It was so deeply insulting and horrifying and cruel. Like it wasn't just yeah. crappy, it was cruel. Yeah. And so Naima, when all this is happening, how's your studio going? Like oh, how's your work as oh, an great. artist being supported? Well, you know, I, you, were you really prolific and like to really be honest, in the zone? To be having honest, to talk to lawyers and cops? I mean, to be honest, I kind of was because <laughs> I started in in reality, I was, and this is a good transition, is that like <laughs> I had made the decision even before I actually physically left the, the you know, I moved my apartment, my studio, um, into found a place of my own lost all those things in the middle of the pandemic, right? Yeah. And did so entirely on my own dime. And it sucked. And it was the best thing I could have done because yeah. wiping the, the webs of their bullshit out meant that I actually got to focus on what I was doing. And so I actually was pretty prolific because I was like, <laughs> like I don't not I'm not fucking with you anymore, right? Yeah. But in the moment, no, I wasn't doing shit, but like being a stress case all the time mm -hmm. and talking to lawyers and, and doing all this stuff. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, again, condensed version, but it was really, it was really bad. And ugh, anyway, I'll stop there. I'm sure I've gone much longer than I promised to. <laughs> okay, thank thank you. you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I was thinking maybe next we could talk about some of our efforts for accountability before we got to the stage of like let's find a journalist who can write about this and uh let's do public events shit talking them because we did spend a long time working within the you know 
the avenues, the limited avenues that have been given to us. Like, for example, Naima, when uh, you were going through your incident, you were not allowed to come to our staff or our fellow wide meetings. Or, or, you know, you were and no, I was barred from fellowship activities um, at that point. That's crazy. And, and so a, a large group of us, you know, something like 25 fellows signed an open letter saying we were opposed to this. You know, Naeem is a valued member of the community. Like, we think this is wrong. And of course, you know, that was another incident. I think Carolyn's exact words were like, if you put yourself in a position, uh, if, if you put yourself at risk, you put all the fellows at risk. And, and just this very victim blaming, doubling down. Um, and yeah, so that was one incident. I mean, we also spoke to advisory board members. They ended up dissolving the advisory board. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you guys yeah, have any In addition, yeah, many, many, I spent so much time talking to members of the advisory board, sending letters to people at the Kaiser Foundation, um, you know, to Ken Levitt, to Stanton Doyle being like, hello, the director of this program is stealing people's work and humiliating them. And I mean, like, Tr and doing truly awful things. And we would get either no response or these kind of, I'm sure she'll deal with it internally kind of responses. And, um, you know, obviously, like I'd said, I tried to deal with it, you know, with my own lawyers to kind of be like, okay, we'll make it you like being litigious, you know, my little cheap ass lawyers versus your <laughs> oil money firm. Yeah. Sure, I'll give that a shot. Yeah. Um, and they just, you know, they just ignored, they just ignored it. Um, uh, I don't you know, know, there are other things too, um, you know, there's, there's, and we did speak to different, you know, this journalist who wrote this longer article, but, you know, there was, you know, Michael Mason, when he wrote that longer piece mm -hmm. that was sort of broadly about, you know, issues in the George Kaiser Foundation. And I remember when that was happening, thinking, okay, that's good. That's putting this into the context of the community as a whole. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. important, right? It's like, it isn't just about me or, you know. Yeah. It, and I was glad to participate in that. And, you know, that we shared that with people and with people in the foundation and that, you know, went nowhere. Um, there were, um, one of the things that I, I kind of want to bring up, I know this is an impact, you wasn't your time, Hyde, it was as you were leaving, but between our second and third or first and second year, um, we got a new contract um, that we were told was non-negotiable, which is, quote unquote, it or hashtag illegal, um, <laughs> this new yeah. contract that basically doubled down on restrictions around where we could go, what we could do, who we could talk to. The thing that really was most disturbing to me and a lot of people pushed back on and attempted to have accountability around was that the contract essentially basically created a definition of harassment within it that specifically and explicitly only protected staff mm -hmm. from fellows, fellows and, but not fellows from staff, mm -hmm. right? So there was no way and, and any harassment, quote unquote, which could uh -huh. be also completely defined by the person who had been harassed based on their own perception. Yeah. Um, anything like that was completely adjudicated by the director. She had the sole discretion Right. right. So right. what that meant he was like, that kind of right. broad so power. No, right. There was no way that any like literally we had we had the choice to sign a contract that said there's no way that anybody in this staff can be account can can be held accountable within this structure to do anything to you, but you can be held accountable for yeah. anything that we don't like. <laughs> Uh, yeah. that's happening and that and again you know I a lot of us I think and certainly I did thought long and hard about whether I was going to sign that but again I had relocated my entire really life yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know this wasn't something where I could just be like well it's a month long these people suck I'll suck it up and then leave or something right so so that was the case and I remember like being in the you know the discussion about that contract and being like, come on guys, like, can we, and people trying to push back 
and Carolyn Janney again, Jim, saying, well, if you don't like it, you can just leave. And also there was like, you know, they limited the number of changes we can make to that contract to like three within an hour long meeting with Carolyn. Yeah. In that meeting, she revealed she didn't understand like half the terms. There were blatantly illegal things like the original contract uh, set strict hours that we had to be in our studios, which is against our independent contractor status. It was a mess. I mean, I know personally for me, when that contract came out, it was like, we had spent the entire first year meeting and, you know, kind of advocating and trying to push for changes, reforms, clarification, like better boundaries. Yeah. And then we were handed this contract that was sort of like, never, ever raise any of those concerns ever again, or you'll be kicked out. Like, that's how we're going to respond to this is mm -hmm. just we have now taken all of, we've heard all of your concerns. And we've made sure that you can never bring them out, speak of them again. And so, and in fact, we'll make it so that you speaking about them could be grounds for us to kick you out of the program. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I also want to say that, like the that point in it was so. Um, you know, that was when you know Hyde was leaving. Other people that I cared about were having, you know, their own issues and either leaving or trying to make hard decisions about how to yeah. engage. And it was really, you know, in, a, in addition to how frustrating it was and bizarre it was, it was also kind of like humiliating because it was like, yes. you were, I don't know if any of y'all have like experienced um, like an abusive situation, right? Or, or gaslighting where even though you can like intellectually know that the person what they're saying is nuts and like isn't true about you or about people around you or whatever when somebody is repeating it over and over and over you are the problem you are wrong you are wrong you are bad you are wrong yeah. you it's hard not to internalize it and so i found it just like disheartening i didn't want to be in the space i didn't want to be like so for example right at the turn of the new year you know, I spent a year trying to get them to like have basic Americans with Disabilities Act, like accommodation stuff taken care of. And it was constant struggle. They, some, you know, I will say that like some of the support staff, I think did try to mitigate some of the bullshit, but like, what are they gonna do? They're also under this same bullshit, but like, anyway, so, but the first meeting of the year, they had in a like completely inaccessible space, like up a flight they of stairs. Want you there. <laughs> I, I literally was like, oh, so you literally don't want me there. Was it a tree house? <laughs> and and when I brought it up, I it was, oh, that was listed as one of the things that was like a contract violation that I brought it up in a way that made Carolyn feel bad. So the fact that like you literally violated a federal law, <laughs> right? All Which this is, time you thought you were in Tulsa to make art, but it was really just about making the director feel safe. Right. And, and like unthreatened. Safe to be an asshole. Good about right. her job. Like, not safe just to like work or whatever, but safe actually to do bad, illegal, yeah. incompetent, unethical, yeah. cruel, inappropriate, boundaryless bullshit. Like that's yeah. what you wanted to be free to do. And, but then the, and, and the racism involved is really intense because the way I kept getting responded to was like, you know, all these letters and stuff that would get written to me from these lawyers, I get called, you know, aggressive and bullying and hostile coded language. and all that coded language of like, black woman stop existing, please. And it was, and that was really hard because that's something I've dealt with at other points in my life. And I know who I am. I know the difference between standing up for myself and being combative. But I also know that by definition, I have to be careful in that because it doesn't take much for that reputation to fuck up my life because it has. And so even though I know that I'm not doing those things, the fact that she's putting that into like legal language and all this other stuff has a potential to harm me. Anyway. And, and I've never witnessed you using bad language use it being a, I mean of course we all say fuck whatever but you're not like you're not name calling you're not um no. you're not raising your voice no. you're not like uh coming into somebody else's space 
in an intimidating way. There's nothing, there's no, like, I just want to- In those letters, she would talk about my posture. I was like, literally my physical body was like offensive to her. And I, and, and, you know, and the part of me that is a fucking belligerent ass bitch would be like, your body is offensive to me, fucking white bitch. Like, I cannot tell you how infuriating it was to see this very petite white woman just literally flex her whiteness and her, her white womanness constantly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a little bit of tear that would start to come and the, <laughs> oh, me, and the, you know, when she got pregnant and she literally would be like, something bad has, you know, she'd be like, we'd ask her a question and she'd start rubbing her belly. And I was just like, I am losing my mind because I know that it's, like I say it out loud and I know it sounds nuts, but that's because a nutty person was doing it. <laughs> you know, I want to talk about, um, br- just briefly, I want to talk about one day where I sort of like, it was like the apex of harassment when I was given these contracts that I thought were bogus. It was like, there's, you're saying that you want to control my work. You're saying that you want, you, you like, I already have a contract with you, A, and it's supposed to last all year. And the, we're in the middle of this project and you're coming at me with these contracts saying that like, if I don't sign these, I'm, um, risking my fellowship and I'm looking at the contract and I'm considering it and I'm not being, I'm just not, um, I'm, I'm not going along with it on principle, but it's the, like the content of it. I was like, I would never agree to giving up the rights of my work. And so I was in the space, the, com- the community space, the lodge, and um, w- one of the staff members brought the contract to me. And I, I looked at it and I was like, I'm reading this. I cannot sign this. I'm not being ugly. I'm just saying, look, I, I can't sign this. I would be betraying myself and the things that I believe. And I would also be jeopardizing myself because these, these contracts are only, like you were saying, Naima, like only things that protect them, nothing that protects me. And so I said, I can't sign this. So that staff member goes back to the office and then another staff member pops up with a folder and she's like, oh, hi, what's going on? You want to sign this? And I'm like, well, no. No, I, I can't sign that. I mean, I told the other staff member. So when I got back to uh, Archer, I had like these ugly emails from two staff members that I had never had any problem with before. And they were written in this language that I did not recognize as their speaking voice. And they were about like um, kind of really specific things like there was a missing receipt for a catering company that had provided like $200 worth of donuts or something. And it was like, if this is not on my desk by 3 p.m., like we're gonna have trouble. And I was like, okay, um, I'll go to the bakery. I got a copy of a receipt, you know, I brought it to them. And like, so this is happening. Like, Like, I feel like, I feel like my personal take on this is that the staff was weaponized against me as soon as I said, I'm not signing your bogus contract. And this happened in the course of a few hours. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I had never had conflict with these other staff members before, but they were wielded at me. Mm -hmm. And like, it it is outrageous. And I feel like if that was another corporate environment, like there would be an investigation around it. Mm -hmm. but there is no checks and balances at TAF. And as far as I can tell at George Kaiser Family Foundation. And whenever I would maybe explain some of these conflicts to people, higher ups that were working at George Kaiser and they would say, oh, have you tried talking to Carolyn about this? And I was like, what are you not hearing? Like we 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 can't get anywhere with a normal conversation. Like we are not heard. We're treated like delinquents or prisoners. Like, yeah. So, so people at GKFF turn a blind eye to problems that the fellowship fellows will, will come to them with. And we're not supposed to like contact the board, uh, the, um, is it the board of uh, advisors, the advisory board? We're, We're like Carolyn forbade that. We're not supposed to talk to anybody at GKFF 
but like there is no recourse for us to resolve these things. And that lawyer that was uh, the mediator, that was proposed, it was a little bait and switch where it was proposed that we go work out our problems with this guy because he was there to listen to our problems. And he was more like a moderator between staff and artist. And like, he's making notes the entire time. And I think that is all about protecting GKFF from liability. It is like, I'm gonna get your full story. Mm-hmm. And, and like, it looks like I'm listening, but I'm really just collecting every, everything to argue against if this ever comes to a lawsuit. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, kind of on that note, I was thinking maybe we can talk specifically about, yeah, these kind of bad actors and the people we would like, you know, accountability. Um, obviously, Carolyn Sickles, the director of the program, is racist, abusive, a generally terrible at her job, a bad person that we do not think anyone should have in their, you know, like yeah. such a malicious presence um, yeah. and causes so much harm. But I think every she time, hired by someone. <laughs> every time, I mean, problems, you know, you're hearing in the chat, we have like Akiko and Antonius who had serious, you know, the early fellows had serious problems before Carolyn ever got there. Right. Um, and hopefully we can maybe do another session kind of talking about that, uh, the early life of the fellowship. But I mean, for me, it's Stanton Doyle and Ken Levitt because Stanton Doyle is the Kaiser employee who's in charge of all of GKFF's cultural endeavors, essentially. He's the head of the Gathering Place. He's the head of the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, the Bob Dylan Center. OK Pop Museum, like every single thing. And he's unqualified. And he's, he has, he's behind the scenes. Uh, he's not responsive. He's totally unresponsive. And every time Carolyn has done something abusive, we've told Ken, and or we've told Stanton, and he's been uh, hostile or, you know, it's only, it can only result in repercussions for us. Mm-hmm. And then Ken Levitt, of course, who's the head of GKFF. He's the head of, the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, which is totally unacceptable that he has that influence. But so he is, you know, the behind the scenes, behind the scenes. And I don't know. I I mean, those are at least three people I can name, but it's like, you know, this network is more than just an individual, I guess. Right. I mean, I think it's important to note that, you know, from a structural standpoint, the program, you know, it's, it's not, a nonprofit, and not that nonprofits are perfect, they have their own bullshit, but on a structural level, right, a nonprofit organization has to have a board, right, that technically the person who is independent and Mm -hmm. theoretically has some understanding of the issue or whatever involved. There is no such board, right? This advisory committee was this kind of perfunctory thing that they put in place to kind of placate the last group of fellows And they did actually bring in people who did have knowledge and who were actually sympathetic to us, but they didn't have any power, right? Right. And so those people actually, I think did, or some of them tried and were advocates for us, but they didn't have any actual power in the way Mm -hmm. that a nonprofit board is basically, they they hold the purse strings, they can fire technically, right? Not again, I know it's not a perfect model, but at least in those contexts, there's like an avenue, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? That you can yes. use with, with, with that kind of structure. Yeah, it's been established. That's a proven exactly. system. <laughs> right, it, it, it is a way and it's a way where, and, and in the context of, you know, organizations that do have something like a, you know, a social justice mission, a, the, 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 the makeup of the board and its work in the world can be a way to sort of like help move and change to when there's structural issues right so that's that's one major thing um i think that the and and i agree with you like every at a certain point i just started like ccing stanton and or ken with everything so i was like if nothing else no one's gonna be pretending that you don't know about this because that's what they would do if you're like we don't know what you're talking about and i'd be like Clickety click click click, <laughs> you yeah. know, like if nothing yeah. else, it's a paper trail that you do know what I have been experiencing and the problems and my concerns and what I feel concerned about. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I agree that it is a, a network of that entity, GKFF's kind of work with, with TAF, you know, I, again, we probably spend another three sessions talking about, you know, the role of like an organization like the Tulsa Artist Fellowship and it's like sort of weird art washing agenda within yeah. the Greenwood District and stuff like that. And, and I do think that that's a big piece of it, but I also yeah. feel like all of us who've worked within the arts and worked with connections to philanthropy, there's ways that we can sort of like say, okay, yes, on a structural level is philanthropy and urban development off and art often a kind of weird clusterfuck? Yes. Does it have to be like this? No, <laughs> right? Like, does it have to be this kind of like no. nefarious and invested in just like shutting down anything like conversation or dissent? You know, if, if your problems are that profound that you have to spend this much, this much time and energy and lawyers and money to just make things go away, then like you've got a problem from the from the jump that you're uh -huh. not addressing. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that on a structural level, you know, I, I I hate to say this, but like on a certain level, I I tried to extend a lot of grace to the rest of the staff, and I still do on some level because I do think that you know um, Carolyn is a particularly kind of insidious figure, and that this is a small town and it's just hard. Yeah. But at a certain point, you know, people were making decisions themselves and doing things that were really harmful. And those particularly anti-Black um, things that were being said to me in that room with Carolyn Janney, the program's communications director, Abby Mashankashe, was in there with us when that was happening and made no intervention, no, and, and no advocacy around that and sort of helped to sort of move along an agenda that I think she actually knows better. I'm not actually sure that Carolyn does. Like, I actually think there's like a firing issue, right? And so in some ways it almost like bothers me more when people who do know better, <laughs> right? Like are being like, yes, I'm gonna allow this person right. to just say these insidiously racist things to this person, yeah. right? Um, well, that's about like the superficiality of being politically woke or being an advocate for artists or or any of these things it's like just because you say it and you proclaim it but you don't live it and you're actually currently hurting people like you're not an ally <laughs> if you're like you're threatening my home and my livelihood because you don't agree with me right now mm -hmm. or you don't want to be accountable for bullshit that you've done right and that's the thing is people can, we can, I'm a professional. People disagree with me all the damn time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, that's just part of being a person with opinions. But like, there's a difference between I'm going to like threaten your livelihood because I disagree with you. Yeah. Or try to humiliate you or sick endless lawyers on you. Yeah. Because I right, th those are actually different. That that's that's kind of yeah. horrifying, actually. And, and um, you, oh, sorry. Uh, because you keep wanting to jump in. No, I. So. Well, I, I was gonna say we're we're coming up on an hour, and um, oh, damn. I'd still yeah. <laughs> we could go. We could go five out. You know, we love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and I'd still like to leave us time to maybe more explicitly address questions from the chat, uh, but. Before we go to the chat, maybe is there, I mean, we were, we were talking last night, like, is there a positive, you know, is there some way where this cannot just be a purely negative, like, shit talk? I mean, what is... I met you guys. I'm happy right. about that. I have some great friends that were other fellows, you know, mm -hmm. but like, fuck that place to death. <laughs> like, I will never, never be involved in anything there again. And, and like... No, thank you. You know, and I wanted to say, I know like I'm, I'm my blood is up and I'm like kind of yelling about things, but like this is like, I'm, I, I want to share my story, not in the way that like I need to be heard because I was wronged, but I was like, currently in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there is a bullshit artist residency where when you apply and you think you've won the lottery and you're going to be supported and embraced, you are not. You are going to come up against 
like such a mountain of horseshit. And like, you should be prepared. And, and the foundation seems to have not a care, not a plan to change it. And like, people are currently being like mistreated. And, hard. And, and like, you throw all the money you want to at that. Throw all the jargon and buzzwords you want at that. It's like you, first off, you treat people with respect. You, and, and in, this, in this field where everyone at that fellowship is accomplished, they have been chosen from hundreds of applicants. Like we are not, we are not, you know, desperate, like people without skills or without a proven career. Like we should have our work respected and we should just be any human being deserves respect. But, but like we would like to do our work there, mm -hmm. but like it was not possible. It, we were interfered with and, but and the next generation will be and the next until George Kaiser himself decides he's not going to stand for this. I mean, I, you know, I almost disagree with the, the very last part of it because oh, maybe at so. this point, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm more on a rhetorical level because yeah. I think the, the, the positive that's come out of this for me is like I said, you know, you said Hyde, connections with other people have been positive within the fellowship. And for me in, you know, it's been really important for me as someone who isn't from here, who opted when I left the fellowship to stay in Tulsa, to stay mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. And I did that on purpose, right? It wasn't, I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 the pandemic was part of it, but it was also, it was on purpose because I have connections here. I have people here that I love. I have other artistic opportunities that have been really positive here. Mm -hmm. Other systems of support, other people who, you know, have, been invested in what I do and who have challenged me and who have helped me learn about this community more. And I feel really aware of the extent to which it is really challenging for people who have like a long, you know, term relationship to Tulsa to kind of sort out like the Kaiser Foundation has such a gigantic footprint here in terms of funding that it's really, really hard to um, do things like civically, culturally, independent education, independent, you know, so it's like, it's just pe puts people in this tricky position. And, and it, it is a privilege to have been given this thing to come in here. And so I feel really aware of sort of like, what it means for me to be like, fuck this thing, right. And for me, so a, I just want to just really say that, like, my relationships to Tulsa as a whole, and to other artists and businesses and organizations as have been positive and have been affirming and have been, um, and I've, ha I've found ways to make connections both while things were happening and ultimately once I left, it felt easier to do because I didn't have this like hovering mass of this like shitty thing that we kind of can't talk about like <laughs> kind of right. over my head, right? And so, I, and, and frankly for me, the concern that any relationship that I bridge, particularly with other like black artists, you know, cause it was so, again, it wasn't lost on me that I was like being brought here to be like professionally, visibly, successfully, successful in black, right? Like this is not the first time I've been tokenized in my life. Like I, un I actually do understand that game and think it can be played in ways that are like fine, right? But when the way it's being done is so insidious and so like hard to get around, it becomes really difficult to connect with other people. And so as I've stepped away, it's felt easier to more authentically sort of engage with things that I care about, and, you know, cause I'm not, mostly cause I'm not worried that it's gonna get like co-opted <laughs> in some way that I don't feel comfortable uh -huh. with uh -huh. um, by the foundation. So that's like a, a, you know, a takeaway. But I also feel like it made me have to kind of really think about like, okay, I was able to make that shift because frankly, I had like diversified, right? Like I had funding from an organization that, you know, is smaller and the money isn't as big, but are like a thousand times more like actually supportive and great. And so I was able to make a choice, 
right? Like I would rather have this than this, right? And I had some savings and I had some other things going on and I decided to like start a business and do things where I'm really trying to like cultivate a relationship to my audience and to my work that doesn't mean that I have to depend on the George Kaisers of the world in order to get by as an artist. And so like, I don't, I, the, the part of me that's like both a radical and an artist is like, I actually think the solution is us as artists deciding to like, to say like, it, 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 yes, the foundation that figures out how to actually treat its people good, great, love them, want to be with them always, fantastic, thank you very much. But we also need to like own some of our own power as culture makers. Yes. Right? Like they yes. need us. They Artists need are us. so we, easily exploited. We, are, yes. we, we live in this system where we're so precarious and our precarity is like built in and it's unfair. And, but I don't know that I think that the solution is to say, hey, people who made this system that were precarious, please do it less, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't know when that's worked, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, and so I feel like for me, it's like, and again, I'm not trying to be like simplistic about it. I recognize that it, there isn't just this, like, we, all, we can't all just like one day be like, we'll never work with the foundation or even the Kaisers or anything ever again, but it's more I like, <laughs> well, not, yeah. <laughs> But it, like, again, I'm in told it's actually really hard to avoid, <laughs> but yeah. like, but right, more right. so, but more so it's like, how do you say, A, I can be choosy and B, um, how do we say like, you know, like you want to do the thing, you want to make things work. You want to have artists doing this stuff, like work with us, like don't treat us like we're Right. Pawns right. and idiots, right? And, and so that, you know, and, and actually have a recognition of us as contributors and partners rather than, and if that's not happening, then it, for me personally, that means I gotta yeah. exit stage left. If, um, if I could jump in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, please. I mean, I, I feel like uh, it's like on the one hand, it should. I, I do feel like it should be really easy for a program like this that gives artists money and studio space and apartments Absolutely. like to to go it shouldn't be hard to keep artists happy you know like that it sh right. it feels like it should be really easy to put a compassionate like kind director in uh, that understands the needs of artists and that could be really like positive program um I don't believe that George GKFF's intentions are uh, I, I think they're too narrow and like unspoken to engage in that. And I think it's important to like recognize that the fellowship came at the uh, destruction of the University of Tulsa's MFA program. And so that there is a destruction of a somewhat organic commun arts community that would be that space that supports local artists and also theoretically brings in outside artists that that was yeah. dissolved by Ken Levitt's wife, who is oh. the director of the president of the University of Tulsa, Ken Levitt, director of George Kaiser Foundation. They are married. They live in the same house. Um, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so I, I you know I think like you can point to that and be like, well, they they aren't interested in creating these types of communities. And right. so I, I think it's. On the one hand, it should be so easy, but it's I, I don't believe that it's possible for yeah. them to do that. Um, because it's true. Oh, go. I also think, oh, I think that like, in addition to that, the like the extent to which the program to me really obviously is like, I mean, I think I kind of just accountability, right? I think about my own accountability coming into this. I think it sort of was like, I kind of knew there was probably some amount of like art washing going on, right? Like that part of our role as a program was like, you know, cause whenever I hear the words community development and arts district and da da da, like at other points in my life, I've actually like run away because I was like, that sounds like some gentrification yeah. that's gonna fuck over the, the brown people in that city and yeah. fuck that, right? And I actually did make a decision at this point in my life and in part because I thought, I believed now naively 
that what I was hearing was like, no, we're in partnership and this is about development. And, and also there was this really kind of upsetting narrative that I heard a lot was that like, there's, there's no artists here. <laughs> it's like this really colonial right. thing. It was like, there's nobody, here. There's, we're just this empty slate. There's no artists, there's no arts workers. We're bringing them in, right? And I remember even that being like, that doesn't seem right, but I'm like, right. well, I'll go for it, right? So that's that's actually also, that's me, right? Like I made that decision. Mm -hmm. Then I get here and it's like, not even just like, it's kind of weird, but we're working it out. It's like, bad, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think that that's a piece of it too. The extent to which, you know, the sort of visibility of like the prettiness and the coolness of art in a neighborhood that is essentially, you know, it's like, we call it an arts district, but there's no way that any artist could afford right. to live or show there if they yes. weren't subsidized. It's the because artificial it's this, Disney-ness right. of the Brady Arts District. Like they didn't, they wouldn't even take the Klansman's name off of it until <laughs> two, a year and a half ago or something. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah that, it's and that was like a lot of shit, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think that's a piece of it too. It's like, there's this, you know, and you know, the Massacre Centennial is is coming around. Ken Levitt's the, on that commission, does he head the commission? He's the head of the commission. It's like, it's psychotic. Um, it's, I don't, I don't know. I mean, and I'm not super involved in that whole sitch, so I don't, I don't know. I'm not a lot about it, but I definitely feel like, you know, I like, I even remember when I first came, it was so obvious that it was like, we need, like, I think literally the communication director was like, we need some blacks up in here to do some black things. And I was like, I feel like there's like a whole part of the city segregated chuck full of black people that I don't know. Like right. I'm not, a, I don't do that carpet baggy shit. Yeah. I, you know, and so when I first came, I was actually very hesitant to kind of like jump in and be like, yeah, massacre. And I remember, um, <laughs> there's, also, you know, oh, go ahead. How, about, go to, how about go to North Tulsa? And where black people live and engage with them and like offer them, you know, like, like a, a community a exchange, like culture, et cetera. Like it's, it's not like black people don't exist in Oklahoma. Isn't Oklahoma one of the blackest states? Well, I don't know about all that, but what I do know is that there is a, that the, the, the racial politics of, you know, the relationship between North Tulsa and the rest of the city are like yeah. really, really complicated. Well, and yeah. and GKFF has also like severely damaged those relationships with the other wings of their uh, mm -hmm. institution. Yeah. And, yeah. but, but then you also have that thing where it's like, but you can't kind of play the game without them. And so that, that's where I try to be conscious, yeah. but also as like an outsider, but also it's like, that can't be great yeah. in the yeah. grand scheme of things. Um, I think about I think a lot about just the land acknowledgments that they have in the lobby, you know, like acknowledging indigenous land, acknowledging the race massacre. And it's like George Kaiser Foundation owns you, you, they fully have the power to remove themselves from that land, too. Yes, they, they yes. hold hundred year leases to that. You know, it's like they are you, you can't acknowledge. It's just such a false thing and it yeah. feels so hollow I guess um, you know this. and I know we sort of like we start sort of trying to fix the the fellowship and GKFF for them but I just wanted to say like like go back a little bit to some of our our moments of having grievances and conflicts that some of these things may seem like nothing like like kind of a minor uh problem but it is escalated because of the like the staff at the fellowship, like like simple things. I thought you froze for a moment, Naima, because you weren't. No, moving. I'm here. I'm just listening. <laughs> I thought your screen froze. Um, but but like um, like these things could have been resolved in ten minutes, but no, because there's no accountability, because there's there's no like uh, sort of like let's work out this together and like, let's trust each other. Like that's not the environment you're in. And so that's why like small conflicts like start involving lawyers very quickly because of the insecurity of the staff and, and like, and the, like how much it's an us and them dynamic. 
Like we're not, I, I, I thought, cause I've run a program before. I thought I'm going to Tulsa. I'm going to be an artist in this program. And like, I love it. I love working with different people. I can work with different people, but it's not possible with the current staff and those dynamics and those fucking outrageous contracts that don't let you speak your mind. That's crazy. Um, well, so it's 8.15 and I feel like we should probably wrap this up by like 8.30. Can we leave? We have like 15 minutes. Uh, so maybe can we take, do people have questions? I mean, there's been a lot of discussion in, uh, the chat and you know fellows green what can the community here's one what can the community do to support artists outside of organizations like gkff we don't want them at the cookout uh by art yeah yeah i mean yeah. my whole agenda right now is you know i started this like sort of design and print that's called trial and error it's just me right now though my goal my vision is that it's you know I work with more like independent artists and the whole idea is like trying to sort of figure out a way to like create stuff that's at like a price point that doesn't just involve like, you know, super rich people <laughs> in yeah. order to, yeah. you know, like I have some stuff that's like that too, but like, um, and so, and I would love that. And, and, you know, I collaborate and I work with, you know, local businesses and stuff. And so that's one thing is when you see those kinds of, um, those kinds of projects, mine or anyone else's, like support them, engage with them, you know, like people hustling. The the best thing I think you can do is like buy work directly from living artists mm -hmm. that are hustling and who don't already have representation and aren't already like big, 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 because that helps them create and, and and you know and and digging into the other ways that they might support themselves, whether it's like Patreon or, you know, because not everyone makes a painting and sells it, but is an artist, right. but like finding those ways where the, 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 the financial support is going directly into their yeah. work um, and, and, you know, recognizing it as work so that yeah. it's easier for right. them to do. And if any of them also are saying, yes, this organization or this thing actually is supportive and helpful, yeah. like also that's a place you can yeah. be you know, amplifying, supporting, et cetera. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think for me, that's like been my kind of, you know, I'm like starting this thing where I wanna like create, I'm making little videos and discussions about like everyday collectors. Like I'm gonna be do like a little like, like collector visit with my mom, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like where we talk about like the value in like, you know, some of my most precious things in my life are, the artwork that people have given me or that I've bought with, you know, my little pennies or whatever. And I just feel like <laughs> us kind of thinking about there being really, really deep value in art and not just relying on the bigger institutions to yeah. support that is, yeah. is really, really critical. Yeah. Um, and it's not all economic either. I no, mean, it would not. be great if you, if you gave an artist a job because all artists have other jobs, yep. but, but also like it's meaningful for you to engage with an artist and engage mm -hmm. in their work in a, in a, in a deep way. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's not just like, if you're not, you know, if you're not rich, you can't play. Right, like, of course. I don't, I don't care about that. Yeah. So is there another? Um, um, I was also gonna, oh, go ahead, Lucas. Yeah, I just, just wanted to add one thing for that is that I also think that like, creating um in terms of this particular situation is i actually think that the way that people have been kind of amplifying this situation actually is a big deal it, it is both affirming personally to not just be constantly gaslit about what's going on but i also feel like i i, I personally don't feel a lot of i don't know faith that this particular program will make the changes it should. I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but I do think that other programs and here and elsewhere and whatever and individuals and stuff, seeing and understanding what's the wrong way will will like embolden them to really invest in doing things in a better way. Um, and that that's worthwhile and that's worth 
amplifying and yeah. giving people kind of like opportunities to uh -huh. do that. So. And um, yeah, kind of on that note, I, I, you're recognizing that there is this effort at a very top down control of culture in Tulsa to severely limit the realm of possibility for like what is made public and yeah the more we can create this community that is independent of that top-down control and uh -huh. it, it, it removes the social power that they have you know it removes the authority from their institutions that they control uh and mm -hmm. yeah and it allows us to build something that is yeah I mean, yeah what about the cia i love um, I mean, do you, you guys do look up George Tennant's involvement in 9-11 and uh, I, I, so actually next week we're having a talk with um, Russell Cobb, who his PhD was researching CIA's involvement in like uh, the literary community in the 60s. The Paris mm -hmm. Review is a CIA funded entity. Anyways, there is a that's another subject, but it is an interesting connection. And I think that that, there is a history of, you know, this like attempt to control culture in really uh, subtle and but less sophisticated ways. People don't know that about Ken Levitt, his connection to the CIA, can you just explain oh, so it? So he was, I think from like 1998 to 1999, he was this, he was special counsel. He was like legal counsel to George Tenet, the director of the CIA. So he left, he was only there for a couple of years, but um, I mean, Houston, George Bush was the director of the CIA. Oil in general, the oil industry has like super direct connections with the CIA. And so it makes sense that Ken Levitt would have come yeah. from <laughs> the Tulsa oil industry and would have had a lot of influence in, you know, uh, yeah. like think about uh, they share like you know, the maps of the oil fields in the country. It's like, who's telling oh. them where the oil fields in Iraq are? Like, that's like Chevron's geologists collaborating with the CIA. As, I mean, anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And that's another crazy thing is that like, we all went to Tulsa to be funded by oil money. Woohoo! Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. Real question. Can y'all unionize? I mean, that was like, we would all have to unionize. It's <laughs> you like, Lucas and I both going, bam. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I, I thought about this a lot. You know, I, I was raised by a working musician. Musicians unionize, uh, you know, film and theater industries unionize visual artists often don't. And I, I have a lot of re reasons why I imagine it. I actually think there's something to the, the ways that our field is more um, in individualistic as opposed to collaborative, right? Like, you know, LA is a fucking union town. It just is. You don't go anything with that, where, about without the Teamsters. That's just a fact. And so, and that is meaningful <laughs> and says a lot. And that's not the case within this sort of, and, and, so I, I don't know what it would require for that to shift, but I do think that thinking in terms of collective power, whether it is directly through a union or not is valuable. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we actually have, like, have to do. Like we have to decide that like siding with our collective power versus with the top-down power is worth doing. Uh -huh. I'm not saying that that is not easier to have than done, yeah. <laughs> right? Like that there aren't barriers to that and but to one of the things about this program is so many of these like weird controlling interventions frequently come down to fear of artists actually collaborating i don't think it's an accident hide that your work was a space about people coming together and that was what was in the way i don't think it's an accident that i was getting in trouble because I was like, let's all be collaborative and I care about this other person, right? Like, and that being like, it is more to your benefit to just look out for yourself, 
-hmm. right? And to keep your head, like when I first got there and was ignoring all the rest of y'all and was just in my studio by myself, shit was going fine, (laughs) right? And so I think that like the, I, I, I don't know what shifts that culture writ large, but I do think that like, that's it. That's, yeah. that's But that's the weird thing is that they emphasize how much they want to connect with the community. And when you take them at their word. But that's just word. <laughs> community is just a word, right? Like. Right, right. another an buzzword. Right, really buzzword. you can say yeah. community, you yeah. know. Yeah, someone was asking how I sustained the space within the fellowship kind of on that subject. Like Mm -hmm. I did feel like I had to, I mean, I I set it up. So it's like, you guys will have no, you don't know what's happening here. You have no say, you don't get to do anything and your name's not on anything. But I, I, I do think it was partially like, if you can establish something that is recognized as valuable outside the fellowship, it, it, I, I felt like I was able to create something that had a little bit of leverage and uh-huh. that like if they were to tell me if they were to try and restrict my activity there I have a platform like we're using yeah. now to talk yeah. about that and that so basically for the last year of my fellowship I've had zero interaction I haven't attended a meeting I've just collected the checks and so maybe that would work for you but um, yeah. it's not I mean, an ideal here, here's my take on that and you know it's it's do with it as you will is that like you know the baseline model I think can work um it's when you need stuff beyond the baseline that things really start to go like in my experience at TAF where things went from like uh, occasionally kind of janky but whatever to like oh my god shit show what is happening was when we were asked to take part in these like marketing projects, um, which they're again, not an accident that the whole point of them is to like get GKFF's name into the world as much as possible, right? <laughs> we're and doing it now. <laughs> in a positive way, right? That's part yeah. of that whole impulse to be like, don't say negative things, blah, blah, blah right? Yeah. So I think that if your practice like that was where I was like hoping like in my second year that I could kind of be like, okay, if I just like, I ignore the, um, you know, but then I just had to go ahead and be black. And so that created some problems <laughs> for me, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. I think it's possible, but I think it's it, depending on who you are and, and yeah. how you sort of interact. It, it's not, to me, it's not, yeah. it wasn't easy yeah. to do. And, and frankly, at a certain point, she's, I mean, they were like surveilling me. It was like really yes. kind of fucked up. Yes. And so like- I it, was convinced they had put hidden cameras in the lodge. I never found any, but that was the feeling. Mm-hmm. It's like, this is supposed to be a safe space where people talk about really intimate things emotional things and it's like and and you you need a staff member there for us to like process our dreams right really (laughs) i mean i've heard i don't know if this is true if you're in there you know the answer to that like in some ways probably the pandemic is the best thing that ever happened to carolyn sickles because she don't have to be there (laughs) (laughs) right like the the things that where problems happened you know Uh at like you think about all these things, these are all things that happened when we all had to get together, right? It was yeah. at open studios, it was at the lodge, yes. it was at these meetings, it was at these things. It's like when that person has to be in the presence of others and open her mouth yeah. and like have judgment, um, <laughs> like yeah. things go wrong. So the fact that the pandemic means that y'all can't, in theory, that, sh- and I would say like lean into that and take as much time and and also co-invest yourself in other things. Like I, when I came immediately was like, oh, there's other grants I can apply for and other organizations I can invest in and other mm-hmm. people I can connect with. And that's been, and even when things were at their worst, those things were continually percolating. Like you said, Lucas, yeah. like it was helpful though ironic to be like, wow, these people are literally trying to destroy my life while I'm like winning all these awards from the Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition. But I think that for at least a little while, there was maybe some like visible shame that was like, it was a little bit hard to get rid of me. I mean, they managed it, but like, 
Um, but my point is like, you know, like that's, I think at some point earlier, I was like, be, you know, diversify, <laughs> right? And, and, and look at, don't, look yeah. outside. And if you see an opportunity that's internal, that seems too good to be true, it is. And if you see something yeah. that feels off, it is. You're not crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, like the culture, I don't doubt that there's people there who have figured shit out for themselves and are like, fine-ish. But I also know how many people when I was starting to speak up would be like, I can't speak about this out loud, but no, oh my God, Naima, thank you for being a lightning rod black person for all of our concerns, right? Which, you know, again, racism, fuck that bullshit, but <laughs> you can recognize that like something that that's, that my empathy goes towards the ways that I think people are dealing with like a kind of trauma response to being in a fucked up situation. Yeah. Yeah. And so like you, and inclusive inclusive of included in that is not talking yeah. about things and this kind of like fear around engaging with stuff right? right so just like trust that yourself like get outside like do stuff that's away from the fellowship like enjoy these big old Oklahoma sunsets like get out to Tahlequah like do other shit right like I think that's the way and so that the the particularities of the place recede more into the uh -huh. background um and uh, <laughs> and then i don't know don't be black <laughs> yeah we're at we're at 8 30 um and so yeah i think it would be good to wrap this up um that, those were some good closing thoughts don't be black, uh, don't be black don't for be all the black. people on the twitch <laughs> so you've heard it here first at okay number one um <laughs> Uh, I, You're like, welcome, Lucas. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I would conclude that Oklahoma is a place I like to be in and working in, and I really like the artists here, and it's a really interesting place. I feel like it's also, for a lot of the ways we're talking about, the role of the Kaiser Foundation the race massacre, you know, just all the, you know, all the history here, it is like kind of on the vanguard of, it's like a, dealing with issues that are ahead of what a lot of the rest of the country is dealing with. And um, a lot of things are happening first here or in ex more it extreme ways here. Years to acknowledge that they murdered a whole town. Right. <laughs> like um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, there's a lot of, interesting stuff happening here a lot of valuable work to be done here it's an exciting yeah. place to be and if we can work together and independently and away from the systems of control uh i think it's a good and exciting thing yeah uh, mm -hmm. yeah hit us up you know like i hang out with gay cowboys down <laughs> and go out for you know do like social distance stuff outside of the um uh you know outside that are somewhat safer and you know like i think there's yeah and 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 try to connect because and and it's i don't think it's an accident that it becomes hard at least it was for me sometimes to connect internal even with people that i liked because we were all collectively being traumatized yeah <laughs> um and so like yeah hit me up like connect outside of it i think those are really and and connect with the people like don't believe this bullshit that there's like no art here and it's just uh, like that is so not true and it's and there's so many ways that that's like racist insulting and not beneficial yeah. to anybody and and my experience has been that people that I have connected with in town have been like very generous about being like yeah we know that this place is kind of weird but we appreciate that you're here Right. And so I know obviously with COVID, it's hard to make those connections, but like if it, it when you see it possible, like go for it because, you know, it, it's worth doing as, as Lucas was saying. Mm -hmm. And unionize and know your power and fuck the police, et cetera. <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> Do you have any closing thoughts for us? Um, you know, I just wanted to reiterate that like all of these kind of conflicts that happened at TAF, they weren't over some insurmountable incident. You know, like your performance 
I heard that George Kaiser found out about it and thought it was funny. But Carolyn didn't. Like really chill. It like and wasn't like, a big deal. Abby didn't think it was funny. Right. So it's like, that would be something that would be like, oh yeah, Lucas did this performance. He talked about George Kaiser accumulating wealth and now it's over. And like, well, what's next? Let's do something else. And it's like, no, we're going to fixate on this like a pit bull, you know, and, and like, we're going we're gonna to ruin somebody. We're going to take their opportunities. We're going to like, you know, and the same, it's like, that's the thing. You don't have to fuck up to be at odds with this fellowship. Like you just, <laughs> you know, you, you know. Um, Are you okay? Is somebody hurting you? <laughs> it's like, I'm just. I, I'm I'm like a mad guy. I'm like you. there's something <laughs> shiny happening. Sorry guys, it's late. Um okay. <laughs> I think <laughs> is that <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well thank you so much everyone. Name and hi. Thank us. you for talking. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Yeah. You made it. Good Thanks luck in Tulsa. In. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Hope we yeah. get to talk again. Okay. okay, more soon. Okay, good. Bon voyage. Good night, y'all.